Welcome to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here is your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam podcast, everybody. I am Sean Graham. We're coming at you nearly live from Victoria, British Columbia, host of the Social Sciences and Humanities Conference and the CHA annual meeting. We're here in the West, and why not talk a little bit about Western development? With, with a great guest, one of my favorite books of the past couple of years, Mary Ellen Kelm from Simon, Fa- Simon Fraser University, author of A Wilder West Rodeo in Western Canada. Welcome to the podcast. Hey there, Sean. Thanks so much for doing this. I, I really appreciate it. And the full dis- for the full disclosure part of the podcast, I did write a review of this book in Strata, which is the graduate student uh, review at the University of Ottawa. So everyone, you can read my review after you read the book and see if I, I got it right. So you can go ahead and do that. But I am partial to this book. I, I really did enjoy reading it, and writing the review was a lot of fun. So the book looks at rodeos and the development of rodeos in the West through the 20, early 20th century. So I, I'm wondering just off the bat, how do we define rodeos, and how do rodeos differentiate themselves from maybe local fairs that were, were very common in the West as well? So rodeo started really at small town fairs, and, and some people say that it started at, at ranch competitions, you know, who could go through the, the most number of horses and, and get them to ride, who could rope the, the calf the fastest, that kind of thing, and that that's possible, but... What I was really looking at was those those performances, those competitions that happened, and, and they happened often at fairs. So differentiating out, like, what would I talk about? What would I include? What would I not include? And for me, I really kind of went back to what do participants define as rodeo? Hmm. Um, and so there are a whole whack of events, some of which are now professional, some of which are not professional and remain amateur, and some have fallen off, um, fallen by the wayside. So I looked at what we call the rough stock events, Those are the events like bronc riding, saddle bronc, bull riding. In some jurisdictions, cow riding, goat riding, steer riding. And then the the timed events. So that's calf roping, steer roping, steer decorating, that kind of thing. So I looked at those events. But I also included things like wild cow milking, uh, which is an amateur event, an an event that doesn't always happen, uh, used to happen quite commonly, Um, goat tying and untying <laughs> and then uh, you know the the wild the wild horse races as well and what exactly is the area that you're studying because the west oh, is yeah. a pretty big place yeah uh, so so and you've narrowed it down to to three specific geographic areas yeah so i wanted to because i was thinking about questions like you know so called invented tradition i wanted to look at the rodeos that could on some level at least legitimately claim themselves to be rooted in a ranching history so i looked at ranching districts so no offense to saskatchewan no well, offense fine. to the the rodeos <laughs> in in you know manitoba ontario quebec one of the big big rodeos happens in quebec it's in sit so i didn't look at those <laughs> I looked at the rodeos that emerged in rural locations set, that had a ranching heritage. So I looked at the Peace River Country, northern Alberta, northern British Columbia. I looked at southern Alberta, the area around Calgary, traditional territory of the of the Kaine and the Nakoda and the Sutina and the basically Treaty 7. I looked at southern British Columbia, southern interior British Columbia, as well as the Caribou Chilcotin British Columbia. So those are my regions. And the reason for those three was it? They all had ranching as a background, right. as had been an economic engine at some point mm. in their history. So the book, because of this, relies heavily on local archives and, and local uh, even oral traditions yeah. as well. So, so in doing that, how, how does that approach and how does that methodology lend itself to this sort of cultural history? Because a rodeo, or any event really, it happens... Especially uh, not because I do broadcasting. So a broadcast, if it's recorded, I can go and listen to the broadcast. You can't go to the rodeo. Like you can't revisit it. You're reliant on documents and photos and and stories. Mm -hmm. So how does that approach and how does that methodology lend itself to a cultural history like this? Okay, you're absolutely right. Rodeo, the performances that I'm talking about are absolutely ephemeral. Mm. Yeah, and and then and then what I'm 
often examining are these remains that are very fragmentary. But my question really, as was always the case with history probably, is, is not, you know, sort of what really happened. But what, what, how do people interpret what happened? So mm-hmm. I was as interested to hear people tell me what they think Rhodey represents as what it may have actually represented. Uh-huh. I guess I'm enough of a postmodernist. I'm not sure that we ever get at that particular question. So, yeah, I taught, yes, I used newspaper reports. Yes, I used, you know, the, the records of the professional rodeo associations. Those told very different stories about events that happened, you know, a singular event. That didn't bother me. Mm-hmm. I wasn't worried so much about triangulating to find out who actually won the bull riding competition. Right. Although sometimes I'm curious about that. What I'm really interested in is what do a professional rodeo association, what do they see as happening as significant about a particular event and know how do communities perceive it. There's often a huge difference. Why is there that difference? Mm-hmm. What does it tell us about communities and how they form? Now, but how do you capture that sense of community then? Because within a community, there's going to be different points of view, different perspectives. And you know, how do you account for that when you're putting together this sort of record? Okay, so I'm thinking always of multiple communities. Mm-hmm. So, for example, you know, when I talk about the Cardston Stampede, there's a great poem written by Nora Gladstone, a kind eye woman, Gladstone, big family, daughter of the senator, James Gladstone, and then, you know, a huge rodeo family. And this poem that she writes in the late 1930s, I think it is, is really laudatory about the Cardston Stampede. And she talks about it. She says that when she is there for the stampede, she feels as though she's going home. (laughs) That replicates entirely what the Cardston Press said about the rodeo, that they welcomed indigenous people, that it couldn't Mm. happen without indigenous people. And yet, when you listen to oral histories conducted in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, both of non-indigenous Cardstonians, folks from Cardston, they don't talk about the importance of indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And indigenous people, looking back on that same time period, even Nora Gladstone herself, she doesn't talk about the, the Cardston Stampede as being this great moment of integration, which she wrote about in the 1930s. So we understand communities as being multifaceted, as always being multiple communities kind of coalescing at particular moments. So I think some of the work that I really enjoyed reading as I thought about it was really about communities as being ephemeral, as being fleeting. Yes, there are some longstanding standing commitments to one another that produces community in the larger sense in the capital C community. Mm -hmm. But then there are also these communities that form for an afternoon. Right. And our interpretation, even as we live that experience, will change over time. And I was really interested in that change over time, in that slippage. So then within that context, as you look at how these things develop, you also identify rodeos as contact zones. Mm -hmm. So what exactly do you mean by contact zone? in the first place. So I, I drew on Pratt. A lot of people have drawn on Pratt. That's no big deal. <laughs> then there's you know Clifford and Donna Haraway's adaptation of Pratt, which I found really productive. And that is, again, in a sense, we can almost think of it as, as a kind of a kaleidoscope that we bring, we bring all these people together. They step sometimes out of their own context, their own context of identity formation even, of community formation for sure. And they mix together. And in that moment, things can happen that would never happen under certain other circumstances that that are unintended. Also, things will happen that absolutely affirm the policies of the state Mm -hmm. or the kind of um, power dynamics within a society. But I thought that rodeo was really useful because it's always chaotic. In a sense, it it is sort of chaos theory of of community relationships of of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. If it was truly staged, then yes, it would have the contact zone would have always replicated colonial relations of power. Mm -hmm. But because rodeo decided to to move from being a spectacle to being a sport, it had to introduce the possibility that anything could happen, and then we get to see anything happen in the contact zone, and then the contact zone, which carries on as people write about it and talk about it, talk to each other, Mm -hmm. talk away from each other in their own communities about what just happened. Right. Is is it almost similar to what happens at these sorts of conferences where we are? I mean, we gather together, but there are people who aren't here, and so we go back to our own institutions 
or uh, for people who aren't at a university or whatever their, their job is uh, as a public historian, and they go back to their offices and discuss with people. And, and so this almost itself becomes a contact zone in the same way, right? Absolutely. But in doing this with, with rodeo, there's the interesting dynamic, or there's several interesting dynamics going on because it challenges notions of power mm-hmm. and how power exists in the West. And I want to start with, because uh, you mentioned it, uh, Aboriginal uh, people and their inclusion in these rodeos and, and how did their presence and then their participation in rodeos change the sense of settler Aboriginal dynamics or this colonial mentality that existed on the West? So, th- so that changes over time. So it's interesting, in the pre-World War II period, what I noticed was that there was quite a lot of discourse around the inclusion of Indigenous people from settler communities themselves. So in that, that often first, maybe second generation of settlers talked about themselves and talked about their community as being a community that was forged in relationship to Indigenous people. They absolutely thought of themselves in terms of conquest of the land. They absolutely thought of themselves in terms of conquest through benevolence over First Nations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But they could not, at least this is what they wrote, they could not conceive of themselves and their community in complete segmentation from First Nations. So that I thought was interesting. And so, therefore, the sport in Canada, not the same in the States, which is also worth exploring by somebody, maybe south of the line, it meant that basically all the best cowboys in Western Canada, especially at the, at the small town affairs, were Indigenous people. Mm-hmm. So that meant that they were a part of the sport. So, you know, the work of um, Morgan Bajoran and Leslie Tepper, where they really, you know, their argument is, look, you know, Indigenous cowboys are central to the Canadian story. That's absolutely correct then that shifts over time. And it shifts as rodeo becomes professional and it shifts as big business becomes increasingly involved in rodeo and as Indigenous people are pushed out of the economy post-World War II. We see mm-hmm. that in John Lutt's work and, and Keith Regular's work and some other people's work. So that becomes a kind of a different dynamic. And so Indigenous people then are segmented out. They start to form their own rodeos and their own rodeo associations. Mm-hmm. And I think that influences the sport Um, Again, because it takes some of the best cowboys out of it. But also it it creates a kind of a a tension that was there, but there as part of the rodeo community, now it's a tension that really pulls the rodeo community apart. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering then, how conscious of this are the people who are participating? Is the cowboy, the Aboriginal or First Nation cowboy, who is winning these rodeos, is he conscious of what he's doing on a larger social level in these contact zones, or is he, in his mind, just an athlete who's going to win these competitions and he wants to be at the best competitions? Honestly, because I, I thought, because it's absolutely the case that non-Indigenous cowboys, they don't theorize what they're doing at all. Right. I mean, occasionally, especially now, they'll say, well, I'm, you know, I'm the true animal lover. You know, they'll, mm-hmm. they'll problematize their own masculinity in that kind of way. Mm-hmm. Or they'll talk about themselves again as men in relationship to the role that women play in rodeo. But apart from that, mm-hmm. I mean, I never hear, I've never heard either in an oral history or in a previously recorded oral history or in any kind of document, cowboys standing up and saying, I am here for white people. Right. You know, it doesn't happen. And right. that's part of white solipsism of colonial or settler colonial society. Mm-hmm. Okay. On the other hand, I can't think of a single indigenous cowboy who on some level at some point in their career does not say out loud, I'm an Indian cowboy and I'm better than you are. It was very much a, you know, similar to the Jackie Robinson idea of I'm not just a baseball player. So for these guys, I'm not just a cowboy. I'm here with a larger social purpose, perhaps. Or I didn't come here with a larger social purpose, Mm -hmm. but now that I'm here and I'm winning... Yeah, I'm going to claim that space. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things that Indigenous cowboys say about participating on the All Indian Circuit is that there they can just be cowboys. Right. They can just be athletes. They don't have to represent, but sometimes they do. Sometimes they represent themselves as Hobima or whatever. Right. So, because mm-hmm. you talked to in the book about how at a lot of these rodeos there were exhibitions or displays mm-hmm. of First Nations culture. Mm-hmm. And usually stylized versions. 
suitable for a white audience. And that these cowboys would have been asked to participate in that process. So I'm wondering then, is there not a disconnect somewhere for the, at least the organizers maybe, of on one hand, you're putting these cowboys up as the best athletes, but at the same time almost demeaning them and forcing them to participate in these stylized showcases of First Nations culture? Well, I mean, as with the Olympics in 2010, your average rodeo organizer would not think that having an Indigenous person march in regalia or ride in regalia was in any way demeaning. Right. right? So they wouldn't conceive of it that way. What is interesting is that Indigenous cowboys, who as part of rodeo cowboy associations, refused to ride in costume as cowboys Uh because they found that demeaning, nonetheless would ride in regalia as part of the Indigenous community because that was strategic and political. Right. Um, at a time of declining population, at a, climb, uh, a time when reserve allocations were declining, it was a way of saying, we're here, we're not going away, and, and we claim our space mm. as being the foundational culture of the West. Mm. Now, another one of these themes that emerges, it's a similar vein as the role of women in these rodeos. And, and So just in general, how did women participate in these rodeos in the early 20th century? There's a couple of streams in the early part of the 20th century, and the first is that there's the Wild West Show stream. So the women, and there were quite a number of women who participated in Calgary in 1912. Well, there was a, a number of them. But there was quite a number of women out there on the Wild West Show circuit. Florence Ledoux is a, is a good example. Tilly Baldwin is another one. And so they were part of a kind of almost a vaudeville circuit of performers who went from rodeo to rodeo and did trick riding and trick roping. So there was that stream. And they were, and you know, again, maybe not so much at Calgary, but at other rodeos across the trans-border west, they were a prominent part of the show, the show of mm-hmm. rodeo, right? Then in rural locations, absolutely daughters rode steers alongside brothers. Mm-hmm. And there was, again, this almost this discourse of our women are so tough. This is not easy living out here. Mm-hmm. Our women are tough and they can do all the stuff that the men do, right? Then that shifts over time. And women get increasingly segmented off into performative spaces. And when rodeo goes pro after the Second World War and pro rodeo begins to be set up in small towns, women are absolutely excluded, except from queen contests, rodeo queen Mm. contests. And it's not until the 60s and the 70s that they start to really push hard to be included in the professional rodeo circuit. And they use very similar discourses to those rural communities of the 20s and the 30s about Mm -hmm. that, you know, this is a family sport. And we're just as tough as our brothers. Right. Does that challenge, uh, or how does that challenge the notions of masculinity and femininity on the West, uh, in particular this Wild West mentality, maybe is more, or, or the idea of, you know, a hunter-gatherer and this masculine outdoorsman uh, is maybe more prominent in rural Western areas than it would be, say, in urban centers or like toronto right this this outdoorsman and this burly masculinity if that's my role as a man in the west seeing a woman participate next to me does that not challenge and and bend those concepts in a way that i might not be comfortable with and i i use i as in the in the 1920s 1930s not me sean graham in 2013 (laughs) just fine out there riding bull next to a woman well first off uh, to this day, am I, am I right about this? This may be changing. Uh, men and women don't compete together. Right. So that would never happen. Mm-hmm. So you could always say, even in the day when women were riding steers, that, well, it's not really the same, is it? Right. Yeah, that steer's really not. And you can, oh, you can still do that. Yes, it does challenge the myth of hypermasculinity among rodeo cowboys, unless you're going to make the case that everybody on the West has to be tough. Okay. And so that's what tended to be argued when women participated in rodeo. So it's not that, you know, Ollie Curtis is tougher than her brothers, but just that the Curtises are so tough. Right. Even yeah. Ollie Curtis is tough. Mm-hmm. So that creates this family environment in which the rodeo can be seen as a unifying force as opposed to uh, something that could fracture communities. Yeah. Because it's, it's inclusive in that way. Yeah. Which is not to say that it doesn't fracture communities, because it did. I mean, mm-hmm. it, when I went, to, I went to a small town rodeo in British Columbia, and I'm sitting around in the stands with a lovely uh, Tukotan couple. 
And the, the wife starts telling me about the, the stampede dance mm. that night and, and where it was and, you know, how much fun it is. And, you know, I had to go and didn't matter that I didn't have a guy with me. They'd find me a guy to dance with. And they were, she was really encouraging. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm kind of going, oh, okay. I hadn't really thought about doing that because I felt a bit awkward. And she goes off to the washroom and the, the husband sits, she says, under no circumstances should you go to the dance. Oh. He says, I take my wife for about 20 minutes. And during that time, she has a great time. And then I come up with a reason why we have to leave. Because he said, by about 20 minutes, half an hour, certainly after an hour, everybody is drunk and everybody's fighting. Right. And it's not, a great, it's not a good place for women. Mm-hmm. It's not a good place for men, frankly. Well, yeah. he, I mean, yeah. he left too, right? Yeah, he didn't yeah, stay yeah, for that yeah. part. Um, and so, you know... I thought that was a really lovely yeah. example of how many things can happen simultaneously. Right. It can be a place where men can use their fists and determine who's toughest mm-hmm. and drink copious amounts of booze. Right. Um, and yet also be a place where women think it's okay for a while until mm-hmm. they leave. Mm-hmm. So a place of you know conflict at the same time as, as unifying. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's... So for her, it was a great thing. Everyone goes to the dance. It's wonderful. Right. For 20 minutes. For 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> now, things start to change, though, for rodeos through the late 30s, and then, as you've alluded to, after the Second World War, with this notion of professionalization. So what is the cause of this, and who's really leading the push for the professionalization of rodeo? It is the elite cowboys. It's the elite cowboys in... And I do mean cowboys. Yes. Okay, so it's the elite. There are some Aboriginal cowboys who are involved, but it's typically white cowboys. And they're really organizing against the owners, as it were, the people who put on the stampedes. And, and in a sense, it's, it's, it's a labor union almost kind of, of thinking. Stampede organizers in the 1930s were seriously taking advantage of, of cowboys where they would... You know the entry fees were so high, and they were paid per mount, and it was mm-hmm. and it was corrupt in the sense that you were paid to mount the animal, and if they decided that you were going to be thrown, you threw yourself. And this does not fit with a code of masculinity. So there's that piece to it. They don't make the kind of money that they that they want to, and so they start to demand that that rodeo as a sport be codified, that there be limits placed on how long you have to ride an animal or, mm. or what calf roping might look like, then there's also limits placed on who can compete. And it's the professional rodeo associations in part that exclude women. Right. They don't want women performing. And again, it's because women contract as performers, paid per performance, whereas rodeo starts to develop itself as a sport where you pay an entry fee and you compete mm. for prize money. So it's, it's, again, it's the elite cowboys. The other piece of it is that whilst elite cowboys, the people like Pete Knight and um, in the earlier period, Guy Wiedek, but in this, in this period, people like Herman Linder, they make quite a lot of money in the 30s. Your average cowboy, who's probably an unemployed ranch hand, can find themselves broke, Weird. badly injured, stuck by the side of the road someplace. And it's Pete Knight and Herman Linder and those guys that are taking care of these guys. And they just look at the whole picture and just say, look, this is corrupt. It's not working. Um, yeah, we're making lots of money, but that could go away at any moment. Let's professionalize. Let's organize. Let's take back some of the control of the staging of events mm-hmm. from these organizers who are getting rich. But then how does that professionalization change the nature of the contact zone and the relationships that are fostered and developed in these rodeos, because it would—it seems as though it would go from an area where local communities are actively participating in the event to then local communities are now spectators at an event. So how does that change the concept of rodeo, and how does it change the way people relate to the event? It changes on a whole bunch of different levels. I mean, the first is that professional rodeo associations start to enforce a whole variety of rules that that constrain the staging events. So they they cut down the number of events. They put a a set limit, maximum on the entry fees and minimum on the prizes. Prizes have to be collected up front. So the organizing committee has to show that they've got the prize money in advance or they don't get the, the designation of being a professional rodeo. So everything becomes way more expensive. Everything becomes way more constrained. 
Some rodeos, it's, they stop functioning. It doesn't mm. happen anymore. Some of them develop a kind of bifurcated rodeo program, and that's the case even at Williams Lake today where they've got the professional events, the major events, the bronc riding, the bull, bull riding, calf roping, and timed roping. But then it's deer wrestling. And then they've got wild cow milking. Mm. And, and you see a different class of people, class but used problematically, participating in both. So you've got the high-end, principally white, principally male competitors in the professional rodeo, and then you've got local people, about 50-50, Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal, and some women. So it, it changes who gets to be involved in the event. And as she suggested, spectators, they stop seeing the neighbor kid yeah. competing and winning the big prize money. Now they're seeing you know, so-and-so from Alberta. Right. Or so and so, increasingly so and so from Nevada, hmm. winning the events, and so it goes right back to that 1912 Calgary Stampede, where Guy Wiedek said, "Hey, I'm going to have the best American cowboys coming to show you the sports of rodeo, the, mm-hmm. the competition of ro- rodeo, and you've got Canadians saying, well, 'Well, we'll give the best Canadian cowboy this prize right. because you know there's not enough Canadians.'" So it, in a sense, it's come full circle. And it's not, I mean, it's still not a spectacle in the sense of it's a paid performance, but it's more like going to see another sport. It's more like seeing a performance than seeing a local competition. So in that way, does it lose something? It seems as though that the power of it or, or the ability to foster these communities, these relationships is sort of lost with professionalization. It is, except for the community that forms through professionalization. Right. So there's a mobile community that then moves from rodeo to rodeo, and some of them come from British Columbia and Alberta. Absolutely. Uh-huh. So they have their own community, and that is still a contact zone community. But you're right. What tends to happen is a kind of an ossified sense of the West gets performed again and again and again and again at these stampedes, whereas in the pre-World War II period, yeah, there was repetition but it was repetition with disruption. So that communities were articulating their own values as they were being formed. In a general sense, I'm curious about the ideas of animal involvement in these rodeos. And, and you know, now I think every, every year at Calgary, I'm fairly confident there's some sort of protest oh, yeah. uh, in, in, some, in some way from uh, whether it be PETA or other animal rights activists. So I'm wondering, you know, 20s, 30s, and then even later as, as it gets professionalized, what is the position of rodeos towards the animals in terms of how are they treated? Are they, are they sort of revered as part of the show and maybe athletes in a different sense amongst themselves? Or are they treated almost as commodities that are interchangeable? Both. <laughs> so, you know, even from the earliest days of high-end rodeo, there were animals that were considered rodeo athletes. The horse Midnight is a good example of that. The un- the unrideable bronc. And certainly, you know, people who brought their own stock to rodeos didn't see them as interchangeable. The idea was that you had to have a good animal to ride or your ride was no good. I'm sure. Right? Yeah. And right from 1912 in Calgary, there were people who protested the, what was happening to animals. But that really develops, as you can imagine, in the 40s and the 50s and onwards. And so professional rodeo itself has developed a whole discourse around animal athletes and treatment of animals, and again, right from the 60s. And on one hand, it's, I'm sure it's legitimate and heartfelt. You know, rodeo cowboys talk about their horse. Certainly for them, the timed events that's their horse that they've trained to yeah. ride on. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty important. But even some of the rough stock riders will speak fondly of the horses that they yeah. rode. And I think I talk about a particular bronc rider who buys the unrideable broncs <laughs> and has them on his ranch in, in their retirement and his. That's very much the discourse of professional rodeo. Right. That we, we, we value the animals as athletes. They only have to work eight seconds, <laughs> you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? right? That said, when you read the letters of protest that are written, and I don't mean from PETA, I mean letters of protest that are written from rodeo participants about other rodeo participants, Mm -hmm. especially in the truck wagon races. Yes, you see commodification, absolutely. Um, And the way that some of the truck wagon race 
um, horses are treated is horrible. Mm -hmm. And it's other chuck wagon racers and other participants in rodeos who are blowing the whistle. Right. So it's around the chucks that the, the clearest codification of animal treatment emerges from within professional rodeo. But as we see from Calgary, it's the chuck wagon horses that continue to be injured. You, there are way more injuries among chuck wagon horses than among bronc, broncs, whether saddle bronc or bareback. Mm. Well, I, I'm wondering too then in that similar context, because in Canada there's this long tradition of using animals uh, as, as commodities, really. I mean, you know, some of the first people, Europeans who showed up were here to catch beavers and cod and, and send them back, right? So, so and Harold is, Harold Innes' whole Staples uh, thesis and all this, so the commodification of animals. And, and I'm wondering if that mindset is more prevalent in the West at this time than it would be, uh, again, in, in urban, because I, I, I'm interested in this urban-rural divide uh. that might be going on. And, and you know, this, this appreciation for animals, that may exist on the uh, in rural areas that doesn't exist in urban areas because in urban areas animals for a lot of people are food or nuisances mm -hmm. that just get in the way so is, is there this reverence to the animals and and that's why these letters of protest would be streaming out and this mindset that still exists in the west animals are certainly a commodity i mean ranchers talk about their cattle and they know what's going to happen to them right yeah and yet at the same token and, and again here's where there might be a canadian a canadian difference you know i know when you when you read ranching stories from the states in the 20th century it's all about the decline of the family ranch mm. in in british columbia at least and i think in alberta is, is certainly the peace river country in alberta there are still family ranches you know you drive through the chilcotin and you drive through a herd of cattle out grazing on grass mm -hmm. you will eventually see a rancher and if you happen to see the rancher and you happen to say you know you've got a cow over there with a big lump on its neck which happened to me a couple of summers ago the rancher says oh yeah that's so and so and they have a name yeah. I mean I'm not saying they name all their cattle but you know that's so and so because they've had to deal with it I'm going to go I know I'm going to go deal with that mm -hmm. this is a problem that's happened before so I don't think you can live on a family-owned ranch and not have some connection to the animals that right. you live on. Hmm. Is there a lack of connection among 1960s suburbanites? I mean, I knew a kid in high school who argued with me that steak came from cattle. They actually <laughs> thought it came from something else. You know, what do you mean it comes from cows? Really? Yeah. <laughs> so now that's absolute commodification yeah. of animals, right? Yes. I don't know about that answers your question, but I, I, I mean, I think there's huge variations. Yeah. Um, and there's huge variations according to the relationship that one has, just in terms of numbers, the animal that one has. People right. respond differently to horses than they do to cattle. They respond differently to cattle than they do to sheep, et cetera. Et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also interested in, in the concept of cultural appropriation. And for me, in, in what I do, it's often used in, in reference with First Nations and cultural appropriation in that regard. But I, I'm wondering, too, with this idea of professionalization, that maybe the professional organizations and people who are doing this from afar, you mentioned people from Nevada who come up, are they engaging in cultural appropriation of these local communities and taking this culture for their own benefit, particularly their own monetary gain, while not necessarily appreciating or giving the proper uh, reverence to that community and the culture from which they are, or the culture which they are entering into. It's interesting. I would love to know what somebody, say, who goes through the rodeo training circuit in the States, what they experience. So, you I mean, you can get a rodeo scholarship to university. You can go to rodeo school. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't come from a rodeo family, you don't come from a ranching family, and sometimes they don't. You know, I would love to know the psychology of adopting the persona of the cowboy because you don't see, I mean, you do, I mean, sure, you do see rodeo cowboys wearing suits, but typically around a rodeo, if you're there, you're in, you're in cowboy or cowgirl yeah. garb, right? So do they perceive themselves as appropriating rodeo culture or cowboy culture or ranching culture? I don't know. What happens when professional cowboys from Nevada go to Williams Lake is they don't have anything to do with Williams Lake. Mm. They have almost nothing to do with Williams right. Lake. So they're not interested in appropriating Williams Lake culture. They don't even know what it is. 
Right. And that, I'm saying that in a more harsh way than perhaps I, I, I mean, but that's been one of the criticisms from small towns or smaller centers about the professional rodeo cowboy is that they're not, they're here to ride on this day, win or lose, they're off the next day to another place, and it's not the one down the road. Mm-hmm. It's the next one on the circuit, which is maybe 500 miles away, and they're either right. driving or they're flying to get there. So the book tries to situate rodeos within this wider scope of, of Western Canadian development. And so I, I'm interested in how these three regions that you've identified in the book uh, can speak to that and, and the, you know, the communities that are formed, the relationships that are created and, and the, these contact zones and the way they change notions of masculinity, femininity and, and settler relations and, and this colonial mentality. I'm just wondering if you could to speak to how these, these regions engage or, or inform the wider uh, history of the West. So there's a couple of things that go on in terms of the placement of rodeo in the larger economic setting in terms of Western development across the country, in terms of my three or four regions. So in the Peace River country and in southern Alberta, with the advent of oil and gas as the main generator of the economy, ranching becomes something that is commemorated. Mm -hmm. Um, That's particularly true, I would say, in southern Alberta, where obviously ranching continues, but it's not the main economic driver. In the Peace River country, um, some of the rodeos definitely are still situated within a ranching culture, ranching economy. Um, but again, oil and gas is, is pretty prime. In places like the central interior, the Caribou Chocotan, when people are celebrating ranching, they're celebrating their own family histories. Mm-hmm. The other change that happens over the course of the 20th century is that Aboriginal people start off in the early part of the 20th century being an integral part of the labor force in all of those areas, mm-hmm. um, especially in ranching. So it makes perfect sense to make sure that you invite indigenous cowboys. They're the people that you work with. They're the people that you employ. After the Second World War, as ranching itself becomes mechanized, more mechanized, um, there is just simply not the need for the number of cowboys. And we see, as John Lutz and others have, have argued, the decline of the Aboriginal workforce. And so that also segments out rodeo and so it it runs parallel to and contributes to the way in which professional rodeo excludes inadvertently to a degree indigenous cowboys it it really is a great study because i love how we can look at things like and i think especially with sport and it's something that that at some point i would like to do in my own work because i mean sport isn't just spectacle and it isn't just entertainment uh, in a way to sort of, although in a lot of ways it is, but th- there's more going on to it, and and it's similar to you know pop culture, and, and it is a form of pop culture, and and how it can inform society and, and inform us of wider social trends, uh, economic trends, political trends. And it's it's really fascinating to me how you've managed to situate see what seemingly would just be local stories and and situate them within the wider story of the West, and, and it's it's really a fascinating story. That, that's being told with this book, and, and I really enjoyed it. So, thank you. As, as I editorialize at the end of the podcast. So thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. I really appreciate it. That's Mary Ellen Kelm from Simon Fraser University here in British Columbia. The book, A Wilder West, Rodeo in Western Canada. Go pick up a copy from UBC Press. You will not be disappointed. And you can follow Mary Ellen Kelm on Twitter. At K-E-L-M-M-E. Yes. So give her a follow on the Twitter. Uh, if you have any questions or comments for me at the podcast, HistorySlam at gmail.com. Twitter, at Dr. Shawnee Fever. And if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Check out activehistory.ca for more features and articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.